A full stomach is always a challenge for the anesthesia team. Rapid sequence induction is our standard method to meet this challenge. But RSI can introduce additional risks if used in small children. After this talk, I hope not one of you will use a classic RSI ever again. First, let me share my worst ever case of aspiration. She was a 14-year-old girl with achalasia, undergoing anesthesia for insertion of a manometry catheter in the workup for planning future interventions. Now, this young lady had never undergone anesthesia before and fasted for 16 hours when she showed up in the radiology suite. She climbed up onto the radiology table and was a little nervous, but the anesthesia team, consisting of an experienced nurse anesthetist and myself, was not. After some calming small talk, we proceeded with the induction with thiopenthal, atropine, and succinylcholine. As I was confident it would be an easy intubation, I administered the drugs and assisted the nurse with the intubation. Then things happened fast. She may have said something about not being quite satisfied with the laryngoscopy, but intubated anyway. There was not a trace of CO2. But there was food, lots of it. I quickly re-intubated after clearing the pharynx from the remains of yesterday's dinner. Now we had a tube in the right place, but SATs had crashed to 75, slowly rising to the mid-80s with PEEP and 100% FiO2. We aborted the procedure and transferred the patient to the ICU for delayed extubation. She developed a classic Mendelssohn syndrome with a systemic inflammatory response until the evening when she'd improved enough to, to be extubated. She fortunately recovered without sequels in a few days. Achalasia, you say. That's a classic risk factor for aspiration. And you're perfectly right. But I wanted to share this episode with you just to remind you that aspiration, although rare, can occur even if a classic RSI was used. For the anesthetist, it's all about the risk of aspiration. Now, a completely empty stomach is a rare thing, because some clear fluid is always present. But a stomach with even a small amount of particles that can block the trachea or clutter up the lungs is what we often call full. But how do we know? How do I know if this baby is at risk for aspiration during induction? Let's briefly review the indications for RSI. It's all about avoiding pulmonary aspiration of gastric or esophageal content. As suggested in the NAP4 and confirmed in the Wake Up Safe report, RSI is indicated when there is a full stomach due to bowel obstruction and trauma with incomplete fasting and opioid administration, gastrointestinal motility disorders, achalasia, and airway bleeding for instance, post-tonsillectomy. Some will recommend RSI also for patients with moderate reflux, or perhaps yesterday's minor trauma. If only there was a way to gaze into the patient's stomach and assess content. Well, now there is. Gastric ultrasound tells you if the stomach is empty or full. Here you can see how we're looking into a child's abdomen. Now, this is cranial, this is caudal. And look at this structure here. It's the antrum of the stomach that would fill up with fluid or solid content if the child was lying in the right lateral decubitus or head up and had a recent drink. But the antrum here is collapsed and the hypoacogenic muscular layer is clearly delineated. This is what you want to see. And if you do, you can be confident that there is no gastric content that can be aspirated. If you don't confidently see this, my advice is that it's better to stick with your original plan to intubate based on history and presentation, as usual. There are more studies underway 
on the generalizability of gastric ultrasound in children. But for now, my advice is that you perform at least 30 gastric ultrasound exams under supervision before you use it for clinical decision-making. A recent report from the Wake Up Safe Registry gives us the most comprehensive data to date, with analysis of 2.4 million anesthetics and confirming the known risk factors. Emergency surgery was associated with a two-fold risk of aspiration. An ASA class of three or four increased the risk by five of the 135 aspiration documented in the registry. A majority occurred during induction, but several also during maintenance, emergence, and even pre-induction, or in the PACU. We strive to be ever vigilant with children, but aspiration incidents occur anywhere, nonetheless. The authors of the Wake Up Safe report proposed causes of these aspirations. 19% had a gastrointestinal comorbidity. And this is why we choose to intubate children, not only with overt ileus, but really any child that may have delayed gastric emptying. 11% had stomach contents for the simple reason that they'd sneaked in a breakfast when they should have been fasting. Now, the good news was that NPO violations with clear fluids did not seem to cause aspiration pneumonia. And this is an important point when it comes to fasting regimens. It's solids we should focus on when we talk about high-risk induction due to a recent meal. The overall incidence was one case per 16,000 anesthetics, which is lower than most published audits. This may reflect either methodological problem or changing practice. But we can all agree that aspiration happens and can have severe consequences. The Wake Up Safe study is actually the first to report two deaths due to aspiration in children. Let's talk RSI. Classic RSI has been around since the beginning of the 60s, with some early modifications, but otherwise very much the same to this day in adult anesthesia practice. In children, there are important physiological aspects that have led us to question old-school RSI. You'll remember that classic RSI includes five main principles. Start with pre-oxygenation, which should be done with a tight-fitting mask for five minutes to fill up the FRC with oxygen. Now, the thing with small children, that there's no point in a long pre-oxygenation. The low FRC is quickly saturated, but the oxygen reserve is still limited due to the high metabolic rate. A simulation study has shown that after strict pre-oxygenation for either one or three minutes, you only get 90 seconds until desaturation in a one-month-old neonate. And we know from experience that in a premature infant with neck, you only get about 20 seconds. On a good day, the important point is it's not significantly increased by pre-oxygenation. And in the premies, you also have to think about oxygen toxicity. Furthermore, if you hold the mask tight, they will not lie quietly like this little mannequin. They'll protest in any way they can, because they feel like they're fighting for their life. Now, this distress increases metabolism, which further limits the safe apnea time. And worse, can trigger coughing and vomiting during the induction. By holding the mask gently, or letting an infant chew on it, or play with it while flowing oxygen, can do the trick. This way, you can actually go on with your pre-oxygenation for several minutes. And even if you don't get an FiO2 of 1, this is balanced by the smooth induction. In older children and young adults, the situation is different, of course. And you have less problems and more benefit from at least a three-minute pre-oxygenation. As a side note, there's a great deal of interest in high-flow humidified oxygen for induction. But at the present, there's no sound evidence to support the routine use of OptiFlow or POINT for pre-oxygenation in children. The second principle is to give the induction drugs in a rapid sequence without interruption. Now, this is fine in children, too. But focus should be on achieving an adequate level of anesthesia and neuromuscular block before laryngoscopy. 
use the hypnotic agent you're familiar with, for example thiopentone, propofol or ketamine, depending on the context. Now, this is a poison dart frog, emitting a powerful toxin that can kill a grown man through muscle paralysis. Now, don't be a frog. Use rocuronium instead of succinylcholine. It's fast, and we have a lot of experience of how it behaves. Sux has unnecessary side effects, so don't use it if you don't really have to. So, do we have to intubate the child within 60 seconds? No. There's no real reason to push for a quick intubation, since you're avoiding apnea by providing mask ventilation, as we shall see. Trying to beat the clock to 60 seconds does not improve your skills, but could add to the stress level. Minimizing the time to intubation is not the issue. And actually, we really know when it's time to intubate by monitoring the thumb switch. The third RSI principle is the head up position, which has been suggested to decrease the risk of regurgitation due to the help of the force of gravity. Now, the evidence for this is rather weak, and in a small child, it seems reasonable to expect the effect to be smaller still. I suggest you use the position that you and the patient are comfortable with. The fourth principle is really where it all began, with Selig's original suggestion to use cricoid pressure to prevent regurgitation of gastric contents after induction. 44 newtons of pressure is a lot, and Selig's maneuver is hard to perform correctly in adults, and even harder in small children. It's been extensively studied, but never proven to reduce aspiration. On the contrary, pulmonary aspiration happens in spite of cricoid pressure, and it comes at a cost. The assistant's hand, and more importantly, attention, is tied up in a futile maneuver, and it can even induce coughing and vomiting. So in short, Celix, just don't do it. The fifth and final principle is avoiding positive pressure ventilation during apnea. Now, we pediatric anesthetists abandoned this a long time ago. Apnea leads to hypoxia. On the contrary, gentle bag mask ventilation as soon as the child is asleep is the single most important way to avoid hypoxemia during rapid sequence induction. And here's the kicker. It doesn't increase the risk of aspiration, provided that you keep the airway open and avoid large titles. So, now we know what to do and not to do. Let's get ready to intubate. Selection of ET tubes should be immediately available, as well as appropriate stylus emojis. Now, it's 2020, and video laryngoscopy with a Macintosh or Miller blade should be your default blade from the start, provided it's available in your institution, and you know how to use it. Even a full stomach can go with a difficult intubation, and that's then it's an immense advantage if the whole team can see what's going on, or going wrong. When I think about that achalasia case I shared at the beginning of the talk, I'm pretty sure that a CMAC would have saved the day. I would have stopped the ET tube from going into the esophagus, and there would be no massive aspiration when ventilating. So this is my gospel. Video laryngoscopy should be your plan A in all emergency or RSI inductions. And if two attempts fail, well, your plan B is almost always an LMA. You remember that in the apricot study, there were some cases with difficult intubation, but first pass rate of the LMA was 99.5%. If you run into trouble with intubation, the LMA will almost always save you. It's so much better to open and protect the airway with an LMA than to keep trying to intubate. So, the next time you approach a patient with elevated risk for aspiration, you should have a prepared and skilled team, an appropriate equipment, a prepared patient, including NG suction if possible, pre-oxygenate if the child tolerates it, one minute is enough in infants and toddlers, 
three and older, older children. You prepare the appropriate hypnotic, neuromuscular blocking drug, and opioid. Positive pressure ventilation during apnea phase is mandatory. You avoid cricoid pressure, at least in small children. And take your time. Adequate anesthesia and neuromuscular block takes its time. So, RSI in children, why not call it regular sequence induction?